All right, so I, I think you can start. If, uh, if you have any questions, please uh, you know, interrupt, ask, uh, write on chat, and uh, mute yourself, whatever you prefer. I'll try to give a light lecture today because it's, it's almost, uh, we're like uh, you know, two hours away from break. And so I know that this is a bit harder to, to follow then. So I'll try to, I'll try to be light. Then I'll, I'll actually, the second part will be more telling a story than, than actually showing some math, which hopefully will be a good segue into the break. So, so what did we do last time, right? So we had, uh, we were trying to understand when is it that we can recover sparse vectors. Right, so we had a matrix, uh, a matrix phi. All right, so this was a short fat matrix, d by n. Right, corresponds to an n determined. Right, less measurements. Each row is a measurement. Right, there was a vector x, which was our unknown. Right, this was a vector of of size n. And I had that these things, right, were in uh, d times n, right, where k could be either uh, r or c, right? It doesn't really matter for now, right? We can do things over the reals or over the complex numbers. It doesn't matter. Okay, and the kind of measurements, we had measurements of the type. where y is d-dimensional, right? x is n-dimensional, d is much, much smaller than n, right? But x is s sparse, right? So, so this was the setting, right? Or we called it x, the L0 norm was smaller or equal than s. And, and S, we want S to be smaller or equal than D, right? And we were trying to understand when is it that we can recover, right? When can we recover X from Y, okay? And I gave this whole story of how, right, this corresponds to, to doing compression even before we got the whole the whole signal or, or thing we want to learn, right? And this is known as compressed sense, right? And just to, to put, you know, everything in, uh, in back into, into sort of first of everything in RAM, what, what we, we define this worst case coherence, right? So if phi had entry, say, phi one, all the way to phi n, right? Then, and then let's say they were all norm one for all j. Then we define the worst case coherence, right? So we define the worst case coherence as the maximum absolute value of an inner product before, between two vectors, i different than j, right? Okay, I'm just recalling things. And we showed, so the big theorem last time, so theorem, this is from last time, right? Or I should say last lecture, last week, was if S is smaller than one half, one plus one over mu, then L1 minimization, right? L1 minimization, which was how we minimization recovers x, right? What does this mean? It means x is the unique solution to minimum over all z of the L1 norm of z, such that, I don't have to do that. Okay, I can still have z, such that phi z is equal to our measurements. Right, and x is the unique minimizer of this. We call this a one. And what we showed is we can do this for sparsity levels as long as s is smaller or equal than this condition on mu. Okay, so this is what we did last time, right? We developed this null space property, all this stuff, but essentially this is what we, this is the main theorem we proved last week. 
Now, this, of course, generates a lot of questions, right? Which is the main of which is how small can this be, right? So there's many questions that get motivated for today, which are just linear algebra questions, right? Which is how small can we make um, how small can we make mu? And notice that, right, a question of this style, right, is now a question about packings, right? Because think about what this is saying. This is saying, can I put n vectors in the d-dimensional sphere in a way that they are almost orthogonal, right? Mu small means that every single pair of vectors is almost orthogonal. So it becomes now a packing question, right? How many vectors can I pack? In, in a d-dimensional sphere such that they're almost orthogonal, right? Just making a note, this feels very much like a packing question, and indeed it is. Okay, so of course we can make mu very, very small, right? In particular, we can make mu zero if we have an orthonormal basis, right? So. Maybe it's worth noting that, right? It's maybe not a very interesting case, but right. So if d is equal to n, right, then phi is an orthonormal basis, then uh, of course we can pick mu to be zero, right? I mean, all the vectors are orthogonal, of course mu is zero. But this is not interesting at all for our sake, right? There is no saving in measurements at all, right? This corresponds to no, this, this corresponds to no savings, right? I don't need any theory. If I'm gonna take as many measurements as degrees of freedom in my signal, I don't need any theory, right? So how well can we do? Okay, so let me start with the bad news. Let's start with the lower bound, okay? Let's start by understanding what are the absolute minimum that we can do. And then I'll show you how to construct a good, I mean, we'll talk a little bit about how to construct good packings. And turns out that this problem of constructing good packings, there's there's countless open problems related to this, right? That come a lot for, for reasons that maybe I, don't, I can't make precise, they come motivated from quantum mechanics as well. But let, let me give you a lower bound, okay? And so I, I put the lecture notes on the forum, you know, in this part, if you want to follow through there and you have the calculations there, we're, we're doing now the, the lecture 11 there. Okay. So we're going to give lower bounds. So we're going to give, so the goal now is to give lower bounds on mu. Okay, and I'm going to do it, now I can do it for complex numbers. Right? Because if I get a lower bound for the complex numbers, then you know it's also a lower bound for, for, for real numbers because I can just take uh, vectors. It's for any vectors of the complex numbers, I can just make them have only real entries, right? So I can think only about complex numbers, okay? And so what we're gonna prove is something, it's known as the Welsh bound. So there's gonna be two theorems today, this is one of them. So this is a this is an impossibility of packing type result, right? How do we prove impossibility of packings? So so this one is a little different because it has a lot of linear algebra to help, and so we're really going to use linear algebra to do it. But in general, how do we prove that you cannot pack certain amount of vectors at a certain amount of distance in a certain space? Right? The most classical argument for this are volume arguments. Right? If you need every pair of points to be at a certain distance, then for every pair of points, there is a ball around it that has nothing else. This ball will have a certain volume. Right? By, by taking balls of this type, you can make them by making them a bit smaller in a way that they don't intersect. And so the, 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 the union of all these balls needs to be small recall in the space. And so the volume, the sum of the volumes needs to be small recall in the volume of the space. And you get immediately an upper bound on the number of things you can place. Okay, this is known as a volume argument. And you can get 
at least variants of this with volume arguments. I mean, in a, in a way, it's what's happening. But here, because there's such strong linear algebra, we, we can do better and we can do very precise, a very precise argument. Precise to the point that the proof is also going to tell us what the best possible packings are. Okay, so we're going to do it, and you, you should try to keep it, to pay attention when I take an inequality. When is it that this inequality is actually an equality? All right, and this will tell us when we have the best packings. Okay, so I'll state the theorem first, and then we'll prove it. Okay, let phi one. Again, today is a is a nice class in the sense that I can write a lot of open problems because once I start defining these things, there's so many open questions. Bn unit norm vectors. Right? Okay. In these dimensions, of course, they're in C D. Right? Their worst case coherence. Satisfies. Okay, so recall worst case coherence, max, I, I should, it's useful these, these definitions to write just over and over again. Okay, it satisfies The way you should think about this is if, if for, for very large n, right? Maybe an observation is for large n. For large n, this behaves a bit like uh, 1 over root d, right? This is sort of the right scaling to have in mind, right? Because for large n, the n minus d over n minus 1 uh, will be like 1. Right? Okay, so how do we prove this? Okay, so let's do the proof of this. Proof is quite nice and actually pretty simple. Although, I, in a way, I like more the proof of the second theorem we're going to prove today. Okay, so we're going to make G the gram matrix of these vectors. Okay, so what I mean by this, I mean G, I, J, it's just the inner product, right? They're just phi i, right? Just phi i star phi j, okay? I mean, in other words, we can write phi as uh, sigma star, uh, phi star, uh, sorry, g as phi star times phi. Okay. Okay, two statements about G. So G is positive semi-definite, right? It's a gram matrix. It's the product of a matrix transpose or a joint times a matrix. So of course it's positive semi-definite. Another statement about G, the rank of G is smaller or equal than D, right? These vectors are d-dimensional. So, right, if we think about these matrices, the inner dimension here, right, the inner dimension there is D. So the rank cannot possibly be bigger than D. Okay, so these are two, two properties of this gram matrix. Okay, so let lambda one through lambda D denote the largest eigenvalues of G. In particular, this includes, right? This includes all the non all the non zero ones. Right? Because there's only at most D non zero because the rank is smaller than D, so this must include all the non zero ones. Okay. So this means that trace is just a sum of these of these uh, eigenvalues, right? So let's write something. Let's like write the trace of this matrix G and let's square it, just because at some point I'm going to use cauchy schwarz Okay, so what is this? This is the sum of all the eigenvalues.
But in particular, it's the sum of this D eigenvalues because all the other ones are zero, right? So this is the sum from K from one to D of lambda K, right? Because the rest ones are all zero squared. Okay, so far so good. Now what is this? Now comes the cauchy schwarz inequality trick. Right, what is this? This is the inner product between the whole one's vector and the vector with the eigenvalues. Right? Because the inner product between these two vectors, where by this I mean, maybe I should use the same Maybe I should be a bit more, uh, take advantage of space a bit more. The whole one's vector, inner product with the vector with all the d eigenvalues is exactly that sum, right? It's the sum of the products. I get exactly the sum of the eigenvalues. Okay. Small recall by cauchy schwarz inequality. Then the L2 norm squared, right? I have the inner product squared. Then the L2 norm squared of the whole one's vector times the L2 norm squared of the lambda. So it's the L2 norm square of this vector times the L norm squared Right, but what is this? This is just D times the sum of the lambda k squared. Okay. Okay, again, pay attention to this was the place where we had an inequality, not an equality. We're going to come back to it later. Just highlight it. Okay, but what is this? Right? This is just d times the Frobenius norm squared. Right, the Frobenius norm squared is exactly the, the sum of the eigenvalue squared. Right, we saw this corresponds to the Schatten uh, two norm. Okay. And this will be exactly the this is exactly the, the, the Frobenius norm. And so let's let's write it this way. Okay. For now, all of it is equalities except the the red uh, right. Except the, the, the red the red uh, the thing I, I highlighted at red, which is an inequality. Okay, but now what is the Frobenius norm? Okay, let's write it this way. So let's see what is the Frobenius norm squared. Right, the other notion of the Frobenius norm squared is the sum of all the inner products. Right, is it, sorry, is the sum of all the entries, right? So is gij squared for all i and j. Right? But now... Maybe I should give myself a bit of more room. Let me see if I can move this over here. Right, but what is this? This is the sum for all i and j, right, of exactly the square. Oh, no, okay, if it's a complex number, uh, right, if g could potentially be a complex number, then I should, uh, I should really write it like this, right? Right? And so I'm already making coherence show up on the left. Okay. And so this is now from that, it's big or equal, right? So I'm already having the inner products being big or equal than something. So I'm definitely in the right path. Okay, big or equal then basically one over D times the trace of G squared. But what is the trace of G squared? Right? What is the trace? It's just the sum of the diagonal elements. But the diagonal elements has simply has the norm of the vector squared. Right? The diagonal elements of G contain exactly, right? They contain exactly phi i inner product with phi i, which is exactly the L2 norm square of phi i, which is one. Right? So then this is equal to n. The trace is equal to n. So I just get n squared like this. 
אוקיי. ‫ג'. Squared is what? There's some of these terms that are very easy to understand, right? The ones where the i is the same as j. Okay, let me use indices now so that we can count them properly. Right? Because those are one, we understand very well, plus all the ones that are different. So i different than j. Okay, but now what do we know about this? So this is equal to n, right? Because the norm of phi i is one, and those are equal to, I mean, whatever they are, right? We don't know yet. But what we do know is that the, they are bigger equal than the worst case coherence. No, we're sm smaller recall, sorry. Right, the worst case coherence is the minimum summon here. Right, the worst case coherence is the minimum value that you get in the summon. So when you sum all of them, like each one of them needs to be bigger equal than the worst case coherence. Wait, so, no, sorry, okay, smaller, I keep switching my, okay, let, let's take a second. So the worst case coherence, Okay, let, let's check to make sure that I don't do the, the signs wrong. So the worst case coherence, right, where is the definition, is the maximum between all these inner products of things that are, that are different. Okay, which means that each element here, because they are different, each of these elements is smaller or equal than the worst case coherence, well, squared, right, because we have squared. And so this is smaller or equal than n plus how many of these there are, Right? How many do I have? I have n squared minus n. Right? It's how many ways I have of picking i different than j, right? And the, each, each pair shows up twice in a different order, times mu squared. Right? Maybe I should write, right? I was confusing myself, so make sure it's clear. I should uh, write here, right? What we know is that this is smaller or equal than mu, right? By definition of mu. Okay? And this was the place where I lost where I lost again, potentially. Okay, but now basically it's done. Right, now we just have to group all the inequalities together, and then we'll go study when is it that we lost, okay. Like this, and... Right, now we just put everything together, so what do we have? We have that this is, this is bigger or equal than this, right, which is the same as here, and then it's bigger or equal than this. So we get that n plus n squared minus n mu squared, is bigger or equal than one over d n square, right? It's just putting everything together. Okay, and you work out the expression. There's no point in me doing it here. And you get that mu or equal is e mu is bigger or equal than n minus d d n minus one. Okay, and this finishes the proof. And of course, you know, of course, this is also true for. Uh, of course, this is also true for real numbers, right? Because if, in, if it's true for complex numbers, I could just think of the, the frame in the real numbers as taking val like as being, right? Takes real values, but I can think of it as being an element of CD. So of course, this is true also. Okay, so now let's ask ourselves this question, right? When is this tight? Right, when is it that we can actually achieve this coherence? Okay, so what we have to do is we have to go back and see where we lost, right? The only places that were not equality was the, the inequality in red and the inequality in green. 
So inequality in red is Cauchy Schwartz. Right? So when is it that Cauchy Schwartz is an equality? Right? Cauchy Schwartz is an equality, right? So let me do it at red. Okay, so Cauchy Schwartz is an equality, right? Exactly when the two vectors are multiple of each other. Right? Exactly when lambda one, right, lambda d is a multiple. Of the whole one's vector, right? Because that's those are the vectors I'm using, Cauchy Schwarz. I mean, if you think of Cauchy, you can think of Cauchy Schwarz as right the, the two inner the inner product divided by the norms as being some cosine, right? And this is exactly one is when the vectors are multiples of each other. Okay, so what does this mean? This means that it's equality, right? It's equality. I, I, okay, I, I realize if I used it looks like, uh, okay, let me use this notation because otherwise it looks like imply, right? It's equality if, right, lambda one, they're all the same. But this is exactly the notion of a tight frame, right? Because if the gram matrix has all the eigenvalues the same, then this means, right, and now this is Im implied, that G is equal to alpha identity, or I should say the lambda identity. No, not, not lambda identity, sorry. That the other one is, uh, is um, right, that, that if I take, instead of taking, right, so uh, phi transpose phi is an n by n matrix, will have its first D eigenvalues be, what be the same value, whatever it is, some lambda, and the rest being zero, right? So phi phi star will be an ident will be the identity, but let me not get into this. It's exactly when phi is a tight frame, right? So phi is a tight frame, right? This was exactly the notion of of tight frame. Or I mean, not exactly the notion, but but we showed that this was this was equivalent. Okay, what is the other place where we lose? Here. Okay, so we lose here in the green inequality. And so when is it that the green inequality is actually an equality? Right. The green inequality is an equality when all of these values are exactly the same as mu, right? Because my argument here was that all of them were smaller equal than mu. So it's an equality, right? So, so the, the green one is equality, okay? When for all i different than j, phi i, inner product phi j absolute value is equal to mu. So the, the, all the vectors need to have exactly the same absolute value, right? So in particular, what I mean by this is all for all i different than j and k different than l, these inner products are exactly the same. Basically, what this means is that the lines, if you have a vector phi i and you take the line, right, you take the vector that goes in that direction and then also to the other one. Basically, these lines are what's called equiangular. Okay, so this motivates a definition. Okay, so here I wasn't, so in this question, I wasn't completely precise, right? This is not so rigorous. Here I was a bit, uh, you know, I, 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 I skimmed a bit through it, but you should, you know, think about it and check that this is actually right. I mean, one way to check that it's right, right, is is to show that if these two things are satisfied, you get an equality, right? And if you don't have an equality, then if you if neither of these things get set, if one of these things is not satisfied, then you cannot possibly have an equality, right? And this is not hard to show. But this motivates a definition of a very interesting object called an equiangular tight frame.
Okay, so this is the following. A unit norm tight frame is is equiangular or is called an ETF. These objects are not trivial to, to Google for because ETF is a, uh, is a term very much used in, in finance and means something completely different. But if you if you search a cumulative frame, you'll find you'll find about you'll find a lot of stuff about these objects. Okay, so it's called an F frame if and only if there exists mu such that for all i different than j phi i phi j is equal to mu. Okay, so this you can think of a packing. You're putting vectors in space such that the angles are all the same. Okay, so now there's this, this really, you know, it's, it's just a, a simple proposition, but it's a really beautiful argument. So, so I'll describe it. Of, now you can ask how many such vectors can I pack? Right, so now there's a natural question of how large can ETFs be? Okay, and this is really a very, very nice argument. Uh, so, so he, here's, I mean, we can, we can do the, the, the proof here. So let, let me first write the proposition. Okay, let phi one through phi n and now I'm going to go back because now the diff the, the now the answer of how many vectors I can pack in the dimensions is different for reals and complex. So I'm going to go back to k. Be an ETF in KD. Then so if k is the complex numbers. Then you can pack at most d square. If k is real, then you can pack at most d times d plus 1 over 2. So yeah, I can, I can show the proof. So maybe I would like to motivate the proof a bit more. So what's the difficulty? So because this proof highlights a trick in mathematics that is very useful, right? Which, I mean, there's very, very many variants of this trick, but essentially something that's often referred to as the tensor trick. Right, so the problem is that these objects, this phi one through phi phi uh, um, oh n not k sorry n k, it's phi one through phi n vectors. Right, there. All we know about them is that when we take their inner product, we get some complex number whose modulus is mu, but that's that doesn't make it that easy to reason about them, right? Because you know, we don't know what the number is. If we knew that the inner product was exactly, say, mu, real and positive, it would be much easier to argue about them because we would know a lot about their gram matrix, for example. We know exactly what their gram matrix would be, and so we could reason about them a lot better. But what we can do is we can create vectors 
for which we know how to reason about them a lot better. We can create vectors for which we exactly know their inner product. Okay? And so the idea is to create new vectors psi i. And what they are, okay, I'm going to use MATLAB notation, but they're basically like the vectorized ver uh, version of phi i phi i star. Okay, depending, you know, on your background and the style of notation that you like, you might think of them like this, you might think of them as just phi i phi i um, star, you can think of them as phi i tensor phi i, right? I mean, these are all, this, these are all just different ways of, of saying the same thing. Okay. But what I mean by this, you take phi i times phi i star, okay, and now you think of this as a vector, right? We think of this as a vector in d square dimensions. Right, so we're tensoring up these vectors. And the point is now the inner product of these we do understand. Right? So in particular, if I take phi i uh, star, oh, psi i, sorry, psi i psi j, star psi j, what is this? It's the inner product between these objects, vec phi i, phi i star. But what is the, right, these are matrices. I'm taking their inner product as vectors. So really, this is just the Hilbert Schmidt inner product, right? So all this is, is just a trace of Right, because this was exactly how we, right, this is, this is exactly the inner product of matrices. Oh, I thought I'm missing a star of matrices viewed as vectors, right? The Silver Smith inner product or the Frobenius inner product. I mean, it has different names in different places. Okay, but now what is this equal to? Now I can start moving on things, right? So this is now the trace of, okay? So I get phi i star star, which is just phi i, phi i star, phi j, phi j star. But now the trace is cyclic. Right, I can move on the, this phi j to the other side. Right, so this is trace of by cyclicity of the trace phi j star phi i phi i star phi j. But this is just now a number, right? Because this is a number. This is another number. In fact, the same number, or the number uh, conjugate, right? And so what do I have here? Right? This is exactly just the inner product of phi j. I mean, let me use phi i just so that things are, right? The inner product of phi j with phi i, which is the inner product of phi i with phi j bar, right? times right? But what is this? this is exactly the norm of phi i phi j squared, which is exactly mu squared. And so by, by this tensor trick, we eliminated this issue that we didn't know the sign or the angle of the complex number. And now we have all these vectors whose inner product we do know. Right? It's like we grabbed all these vectors and we made all the inner product be positive. And now their inner products are the same. They're not just the same up to a sign or, a, or an angle. And now we can reason about how many there, there are. Yeah, of course. Oh, uh, we don't, we don't, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's just to make that, to make clear that, to think of, yeah, yeah, we don't, we definitely don't need, uh, right. I mean, I could write, uh, yeah, 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 I agree, it's just, you know, depending, sometimes there's people with different backgrounds and depending where, right, you might be used to, but yeah, this this is the same. Or sometimes it's called Hilbert Schmidt. But yeah, we definitely don't need this notation. But if you were to say write it on MATLAB or something, you would write it this way.
But yeah, thanks, thanks for the question. Yeah. I just wanted to make clear that we're creating, right? We're creating vectors in an, in another, uh, you know, um, in another space. But right, the right way to think about it, of course, is a space of matrices. Yeah. Okay. So now we can take. So now let's take. Let's take its right. Let's take its its gram matrix or their gram matrix. Let's call their gram matrix H. Right, what is H? H is a matrix now. So, right, this, oh, oh I, I should have said, right? I wrote this if I is different than J. If I is the same as J, then this is one, right? Because the inner product is one. So H, their gram matrix, right? This is an N by N matrix. Okay, so what is this matrix? Has used as ones here. Right, then it has mu squares in the diagonal. So what is this equal to? I mean, I can write this as, right? All in the, in the outside diagonals is all mu squares. Right? So I can write this as, you know, it's like mu square times the whole ones matrix. You can write it as one, one transpose. Plus in the diagonal, you get one. So I should do one minus mu square identity. Okay, but what is the rank of this matrix? Right, this is positive semi-definite, right? And this, as long as mu is not one, as long as mu is strictly smaller than one, right, which we need to, otherwise, you know, two of the vectors are the same, right? So since right, mu square is different than one, Right, this has full rank, and this is positive semi-definite. This is also positive semi-definite, so it can't it can't uh, take away any of it can't zero out any of the eigenvalues here. So H is really strictly positive semi-definite. Right, all the eigenvalues are are positive, and so this means in particular that the rank is exactly equal to n. On the other hand, so on the other hand, the other hand, the rank of H needs to be smaller or equal than the dimension, right, of the subspace right, the dimension of the subspace spanned by the, these vectors, the hi, hi stars, right? For, uh, you know, i from one to s to n, right? But oh, these are just, right? They are d square, they are d square, they, they have at most d square elements, right? So of course this dimension is at most d square for, uh, for complex numbers, right? The dimension, you know, of the span of, of these of these elements is for sure smaller or equal than this square, right? Because that's how many entries there are. Right? Thus n needs to be smaller or equal than this square. 
and for for you know for for and for reals when we're in rd basically due to symmetry right because you know they can't they, 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 they are they are symmetric right so what's on the top of the diagonal is the same as what's on the bottom their dimension is a lot it's smaller right it's basically how many different entries there can be right and so we get that n is small and you just count these uh, right you count how many there are it's basically half t square uh, minus plus half t right so Right, so usually this gets written as, uh, you know, half of d times d plus one. Right, it's half of it's half of the non-diagonal entries plus d. Right, the non-diagonal entries are d times d minus one. You have to add d, but because of the one half, the minus one becomes a plus one. Right, and so this is the proof. Okay, so sorry for taking three extra minutes. I'm happy to stick around to answer questions. Then I'll I'll tell you a few open problems related to this.